Hello. They may be distinct fields, but there is some shared DNA between games design in video games and tabletop games. My guest today has spent an illustrious career researching, talking about, and developing games of each kind, considering the culture that surrounds them and the perceptions of playing them. His work in video games has seen him lead development on near real time news games, give TED talks on the nature of democracy in video gaming, and co found Auroc Digital, the studio that has adapted Games Workshop classics like Chainsaw Warrior and Dark Future, and more recently, to create the first person retro shooter, Warhammer 40,000 Bolt Gun. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Thomas Rawlings. Thomas, thank you for joining me. I just wanted to start by talking about your extensive career in games design and sort of the, the gaming industry, and maybe just getting a broad overview of the, the kind of roles you've done throughout that career. Yeah, well, um, so I've been working as a, a video game designer for uh, just over 25 years now. And uh, I actually trained in psychology and then worked in sort of social work and stuff like that. And then, you know, and that's hard work and hats off to anyone who does that work. I know how hard that work is. And I was taking a break from that for a little bit. And a, a friend of mine worked at a video games company and he said they're looking for somebody just for a temporary job. Um and so I, I kind of got that temporary job. And this was long before there were courses and structured ways of people getting into an industry. Um, and obviously, as soon as I started doing that, like, you know, I, I knew that I had this vast fascination, interest, geekdom of it and, and had, in effect, been designing games myself in my spare time. I'd been trying to write games on like the BBC Micro and the ZX81 and stuff like that. So, you know, and, and writing my own adventures and writing my role playing games and stuff like that. So, you know, I was I was very enmeshed in that and it just kind of all unlocked that love of it. And I really loved doing it. And then, yeah, what started out as a three month temporary contract while I took a break from what I considered my career was going to be became my career. Uh, and I think one of the things I, I love about this is having been my career now is I remember, you know, being much younger and being in the throes of, the, you know, the super loving of Warhammer and D and D and all that kind of stuff. Um, chatting with my dad and my dad was concerned because he was like, what are you going to do when you grow up? And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to make games. I'm going to be a games designer. And he's like, well, that's not really a, a profession. I can't see you making a living from that. So he sort of encouraged me to learn draftsmanship and draftsmanship was the te technical drawing. It was also called, which was the, you know, using pen and paper and, and pencil drawing out technical drawings of like engineering pieces and things like that. And so I started learning that, and I did graphical design in school. So I started learning this thing. And the irony became that as a profession completely died because AutoCAD came along and everybody did it in a computer. Then you didn't draw the stuff out by hand. And this thing that my dad was, you know, and again, his, his heart was in the right place. He was just worried I wouldn't be able to make a living. The thing that he, and obviously it was not part of his worldview, uh, has actually become the thing that I've, you know, made a very successful career out of. So yeah, for me, you know, it, it, it's been a joy. And I think one of the things I love about what I've been lucky enough to do as a job is I actually look forward to work. I enjoy Mondays, you know, and I, I get to do work with so many talented people on so many fascinating things that, yeah, I, I kind of love what I do. So, yeah, so that that's kind of the, the long and the short of it really was, you know, I got that opportunity. And then so I worked at first for a company called uh, Hot House Creations, created a game called Abomination, the Nemesis Project. I left there, went to a company called Pivotal Games. Uh, we worked on the Conflict Desert Storm series of games and the uh, game adaptation of The Great Escape. Um, and then I, I left there and started my own thing. So I started, you know, uh, with a couple of other uh, people. We started a games company, did that for a bit. It kind of went okay. And I ended up selling my stake in that one, starting another one. Uh, in fact, I started two or three, to be honest, you know. And again, doing your own thing takes time. Like no one gets it right the first time, or it's very rare, should I say, that people get it right the first time. Um, and then, yeah, and then, you know, after a while back in 2010, founded Auric Digital with my wife. We co-founded it. It was initially a consultancy. And then we were sort of helping organizations understand the gaming landscape and, and how they could, you know, 
because it's an important part of media. I think by then, you know, we're going back, obviously, you know, over a decade, we'd got this point where, if you like, the wider culture considered forms like, and we're going to touch on this, I'm sure, in some of the other questions, the wider cons- culture considered forms like video and TV and books uh, and all and, and music to be culturally important. And it, it absolutely didn't consider games. And I would say all games, board games, video games, to, to the, these were childish things. And, and there was a sea change happening there where organizations were realizing that actually there was a vast number of people who play games. And in a lot of cases, it was their primary media that, you know, they weren't watching TV, they weren't reading magazines or books, they were getting it through, um, they were understanding a lot of the culture through gaming. So that's why they started to engage with that. Um, and then, yeah, after, after doing that for a couple of years, we went, uh, Oroch Digital went from consultancy back into more game development, which was obviously my love. And then we kind of grew and grew from there. And, and now, you know, from myself and my wife, um, we, we're at the kind of lucky position where we became part of Sumo Group back in 2021. And I run a studio of about 130 people now, um, which is, uh, again, which I'm really loving doing. is really exciting. Great. Yeah, I mean, a fascinating career then. So you mentioned Warhammer and D&D uh, in there as well. So do, have you always been a gamer? Is that what sort of informed that desire to, to create the games as well? Yeah, I think I've always loved that kind of nerdy stuff. And it's always kind of really spoke to me, you know, really clearly. So um, I came across D&D when I was in school, I think I want to try to remember now, probably about age 10, 11. And so that would have been what is effectively first edition d and I've still got the book back there. Um, and although it's not quite the first edition, I think it's like the 1.5 edition, if you look at all the editions out. And, and that just blew my mind. Like playing D&D was absolutely mind blowing. I, I couldn't conceive of such a thing existed because, of course, we played imaginative games where, you know, I'm the orcs, you're, you, you know, you're the elves. And we, you know, I, I'd seen, you know, I, my mum read my mum read me The Hobbit as a child. So I, I really loved all that sort of stuff. But the idea that there was this game with these rules that you could understand and you could progress and there was a story and it wasn't just making stuff up. I mean, there was that part of it, but that structured rule thing which takes it from pure play into a game, you know, again, getting into definitional things, but a game is, you know, you start to have a rule system and structure and that absolutely fascinated me. And so, yeah, yeah, I fell deeply into that. And then from there, never really looked back. And obviously, you know, I, I discovered then that there was, I'd seen little bits of books and knew that there was these things called war gaming and that fascinated me. And for the first bit, I didn't have anything. So I had a bunch of toy soldiers and we'd invented our own, me and a, friend had invented our own rule system because i'd seen that people did it i just just didn't know what it was we invented our own rule system to play toy soldiers in effect and then came across oh actually there are these games so it was warhammer fantasy battle first because it was you know this would have been around about 85 86 um and then you know also discovered BattleTech uh and, and a couple of other things like ogre um c jackson games ogre and and again that just just completely continued to kind of blow my mind that there was all this stuff and then yeah that just became my life for many years was just utterly fascinated by all this stuff and in fact you know one of the nice things about being so fascinated from it was um when i went for the job at pivotal games the guy who ran pivotal games then uh, is a guy called jim bambra now he was ex of tsr uk and then games workshop and he was a uh, co-editor of warhammer Forty Thousand and one of the authors of a lot of the the, you know, the enemy within campaign. And so in normally in a job interview, you do your stuff and we've got a whole podcast on Oracle Digital if you want to know trips and tips and tricks and techniques for doing a, a job interview at a creative company, because I've done a lot of them. But when you're doing an interview, it's always good to ask questions. It shows you care about the organization or the people you're going to work for, that you've taken the time to research them. And so I'm going for the job of Pivotal Games and they, they ask me a bunch of questions and, and Jim says, do you have any questions? And I'm like, yeah, I did actually. Um, in Warhammer 40,000, Shuriken catapults and bolt guns, like Shuriken catapults have following fire, which is really cool when you're playing it. And they've got a better save, uh, got a better damage against the, you know, the armor save. And yet they're the same points cost. Like, so I, I basically just asked a bunch of questions about <laughs> Warhammer 40,000 in the job interview, which was not what the job interviews do, but you know, that, so th- that was how enmeshed it was. And, you know, I, I think for me, you know, that, that was, part and parcel of that whole thing so yeah the, the kind of nerdery and and i think what's nice is now that nerdery has kind of gone full circle to being a thing you know and i remember when i was a teenager it, you know I, I kind of backed off it a bit not because i didn't want to do it 
but just because everybody's like, but that's the kid stuff and you're now growing towards becoming an adult, like surely you should put away those childish things. And a part of me is like, yeah, but I still really like them. And what I, li- I like about where we are now is that acknowledgement that these things are are the same. So for me, I'll never th- throw shade at say somebody who's into train spotting because that's their passion and they love it. You go do that. You know, I'm not going to throw shade at someone who loves football. I don't really like football, but if you love football, great. And I see zero difference between somebody cosplaying dressed as a space Marine and somebody wearing uh, an Aston Villa football shirt. They are both showing their, their, the thing that they are, are, are into, they're showing their identity and and all good, good to them from my point of view. So yeah, it's nice that, that we're there in the culture now where there's a recognition of the cultural value of all of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it has moved and evolved quite a lot over time. But one of the things that interests me about some of your work, actually, is that you have done a lot of research and talks and sort of extensively sort of examined that aspect of culture and perception of gaming. I wonder if you might explain a little bit about some of that work and how you became interested in that aspect of of gaming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for a, a little bit of the context of it. So when, especially when I was doing the consultancy, but, but all the way through, I've, I've had kind of connections with people at various universities and stuff like that. And, and you know, and again, there's been a lot of great academics who've recognised the value of these sort of things and so, so started pushing on that. So when I was doing the consultancy, and again, we're talking around about 2010, there was a gradual recognition uh, that I, I think is there now, that video games could be more than just like I say these childish throwaway things uh and so I remember there was this great piece in in um that somebody had written about um Bioshock the video game Bioshock and how Bioshock was essentially a critique of the libertarian political philosophy and and that's a great example of what art does and again I'll, I'll simplify a massive debate because obviously whole books are in but in essence you know Art is something where you can argue there are layered meanings. There, there are, there are the, the, the interpretation of what it is is partly in the person viewing the artwork and partly in the intention of the artist, whereas a craft is, is just something. So a, a beautifully made chair can be an object of craft and really nicely made, but it is just a chair. You're not going to perceive it as anything else. But you can go in a gallery and find examples of chairs that people have made that have other meanings to them that are trying to tell you something else by it. And I think we got to the point with you know where games were talking about wider cultural things and so yeah in the early days of Warwick Digital we 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 experimented this idea of news gaming um, which was like games conveying stuff in the real world and at the time it was hugely controversial and you know um, a couple of uh, platform gaming platforms refused to allow our stuff on it and they they were like well no you, you can't you can't do this and my my point was always well why why can't I like if if you're saying to to comment on world events is fine if it's in an essay, if it's in a documentary, if it's in a news program, if it's in a song. They are all acceptable forms to convey commentary. But as a games designer, I can't, I'm not allowed in there to do my critique. Somehow my medium to, to talk about things is invalid. And I, my point was, no, it's not invalid. As ever, the, you know, if somebody's going to go too far with something or say something inappropriate, it's not the medium they're using, it's what they've actually done. And I, my point was, I think games should be judged on what they do, not the fact that they are games intrinsically. And that's not to say every game is therefore art. There's loads of games that are not art, but there are absolutely games that are art and there are absolutely artistic elements within games. And, and again, I think that's that's been part of, of what we've done. So, you know, being involved in academia and, you know, doing talks and lectures uh, on the circuit and being involved in large sort of media organisations like the BBC and stuff like that that we've done, it's allowed me to kind of really fly the flag for games and and by games, I mean both physical and digital fly the flag for games as a really valid cultural medium. And, you know, I I think it's really exciting that, that like I say, the tide has very much turned now where you just don't see people turning their nose up at games in the way that I definitely saw a decade or so ago. And again, I, I think similar, let's take another form that I would consider can be art, the comic early history of comic people denigrated them in fact there were campaigns to ban them because they were poisonous to the mind and then then there's a realization no they're just a valid cultural form and then you get things like pop art you know linked Liechtenstein and people like that doing um interesting stuff with it and then you get comics like mouse uh and from hell uh, and 
And I think you could not charge that those are not comics that are important cultural artifacts that are conveying more than just the story. Uh, and, and I think similar now that we, like I say, we've seen the same with games and other mediums where there are important cultural works. And, and again, I would now say we're definitely at the point, say with something like D&D and with Warhammer, they are important cultural things. They're important cultural artifacts whose value to the culture is way more than just a bunch of miniatures on a table or, or a bunch of rule books. Like they have cultural impacts outsized to the number of people who play them. Uh, and that to me is really exciting. I realize I've rambled slightly on that, so sorry. No, it's, it's all fascinating stuff, Thomas. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I suppose if we, if we unpack some of that, I mean, if we start with the, mm. the news game piece that you mentioned. So, this was an attempt to sort of integrate news and current affairs into a sort of gamified experience. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. So we covered a, a variety of topics on it. And, and yeah, we would, the idea was we'd make games very quickly. So typically a, a video game, and again, it depends on the size and scope of it, but, but most video games take around about two to three years to make. But this was the idea of making them incredibly rapidly. So, so that myself and the team that I had around me then, we would, we would at one point making a game a week, but it meant they were very rapid turnaround because they're responding responding to something happening in the culture now. And like I say, and it's it's just it's the way of thinking about it, it that that gives. So, for example, there was a story many years ago about cotton picking in Uzbekistan, and the story sort of conveyed like that. Lots of young kids were being pressed into doing this stuff. They were paid next to nothing for it, and and I thought, okay, how do I represent that in a game? So I had this idea of saying, okay, let's let's create a little it was a little mobile app game where you've got to pick cotton and you get a certain amount of time to do it and you've got to get a certain amount of money and what you realize in playing the game is you spend buttons, pick 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 you press it and you make almost nothing out of it and then the player gets frustrated and it's like well this is rubbish like i'm not having any fun and i've made no money and you're like yes that's the point that is what i wanted to convey and i could tell you that in a news story and say they make no money and it's really hard work or I could take a tiny slither of that experience. I'm not saying it's exactly the same because it's not, and give you the actual, a little bit of the experience of what it's like to labor away at a seemingly pointless task for an amount of time and get paid nothing for it. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, that's one of the things that games can do. There's a whole bunch of things that games can do, but they, they can put you in the shoes of a protagonist. They can put you in a position. They, unlike, say, a film or an essay or a news report, they allow you to replay it and take different choices and see what comes out of it. So to me, games have a lot of value to bring to play about um, that that other cultural forms can't do. And that's why I feel that they are a, a valid part of our overall cultural landscape. Yeah. I mean, how do you... It must be a fine line to walk to try and get that in a way that is sort of sustainable as a game so people would want to come and play it and would want to come and try the next one because if it's just a sort of bleak experience which yeah, no, these things are representing yeah. right so it's understandable but how do you get that like the gameness uh, out of it it it's it, it can can be hard and uh you know we we did this for a few years and in terms of as like as a as a business thing uh, that that didn't kind of work out how i hoped it worked out what it did do for us though is it kind of it, it made that on certain types of games and not every game is is appropriate for this us going out and, and understanding the real world part of that allows us to make a game with a lot more depth to it uh and so a lot of the lessons we learned from doing that news gaming became really embedded in you know uh firstly in the the game that we did one of the games we did games workshop in in dark future and then also in a kind of a game we did later called Mars Horizon, which is a, a, a strategy management game where about um, running your own space agency and trying to get people to Mars. So in the Dark Future one as an example, if you go back to Dark Future, which fantastic game, loved as a kid, so the opportunity to make a game of that was really cool. But if you go back to the rule book on that, they use climate change as one of the narrative setups as to why the world had kind of gone to shit. Um, and that's fascinating to, to see all that now that back then the designers are like, how can we do this now? So, so we then wanted to engage with that as like, okay, this is very prescient, you know, and we wanted to engage with, you know, that's Richard Halliwell's work. So we wanted to engage with that as part of it, which we did. Uh, so we consulted with scientists and experts as part of the creation of that. 
And then when we came to do Mars Horizon, the lessons we learned with engaging with experts, we were able to go even further. So we worked with the UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency. Uh, and it was just a real, really amazing experience where you we would create, you know, we're making parts of gameplay stuff. We were sharing them with them. They would give us feedback on it. And again, we, we, we're trying to make it authentic, not realistic. And again, we're like, what's the difference? Well, the realism is, you know, a mission that the European Space Agency might plan might take 20 years from the initial stage of let's do this to it actually happening. And obviously that's not going to work in a game. You've got to do stuff like truncating time and things like that. But what you want it to be realistic, you want it to be authentic as in that does convey some of the experience of what it's like. So a good example would be in Mars Horizon, you get a percentage chance of uh, a launch happening. And I was showing that to one of the people from the European Space Agency. Uh, and he said, yeah, that's kind of how we do it. As in, we calculate what percentage chance we think that this will have a success. And if we our calculations are it's too low, we don't proceed with it because there's too high risk of failure. It's just, so then your question just becomes like, that's exactly how it happens. What percentage of failure risk are you willing to tolerate? And that we're able to give to the player and say, you know, I think the European Space Agency, they, they obviously must have, I don't know what it is, really high. They want that, that the percentage of success to be incredibly high. But, you know, in the early days of the, the space race, they were definitely putting up rockets and missions that probably had very low chance of success because they were they were learning it all. So, yeah, there's an example of where there's a there's a real world thing and we're able to embed that into the gameplay and let the player experience some of that, how it really goes. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And I think that sort of the kind of mechanics that exist in games naturally in a lot of ways, aren't they? And you, But it turns out that they're, they're in the real world. Yeah, and I mean, that, that in that case, it turned out that that was useful. So, you know, but, you know, so we, we're working on a sequel to that, Mars Horizon 2, uh, and this is about the search for life in our solar system. And, you know, we, we've been lucky enough to chat with um, a, a bunch of people who are researching this stuff for real. So I, I think there is a reasonable chance that within our lifetime, we may well find evidence of past life or current life somewhere else in the solar system and it's you know almost certainly single cell uh stuff but that will be a mind-blowing moment in the history of our species and so again I, I feel incredibly privileged and lucky to be able to to work with a bunch of talented games developers on a game with that and then we get to talk to all these scientists looking at this sort of stuff in reality and trying to reflect what they're doing in what we're doing so yeah it it it, it it still kind of blows my mind that we get to do all this. But for me, to take it all the way back, that journey started messing around with the ZX81 and trying to build dungeon modules in D&D. Like the, the skills and experiences I learned then are very much with me now as I'm, you know, as I'm work, you know, working on, on the current projects that we're doing. Mm. Yeah, I suppose there's always going to be that, uh, that, that th through line of gaming as a way of learning, I suppose, because it's a sort of big part of a lot of people's childhoods, especially in in the hobbies that, that that we're in, where you learn a lot about yourself and your friends and the world through the interactions you have in games and sort of bringing that into modern game design is quite an interesting idea. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, I think what we're realizing now and, you know, and I mentioned like the, the you know, culture, when you get a new thing, cultures often go through a kind of worry about it. So I mentioned it with comics, you know, you can go in the, the horror comic scares of the 50s. Um, and then if we, we can't forget, and I, again, I do remember the tail end of this with Dungeons and Dragons, the, the, the kind of the scare that somehow people pretending to be a wizard um, would, would, would somehow be negative. And I think what's fascinating now is, with comics, there's a pretty universal sense that this is a positive, again, depending on the comic you're reading, but it's a pretty universal sense that this is a positive thing for pe for kids to be doing because they're reading, they're learning stuff. Like my kids have got a, a comic version of The Hobbit, which they love. My youngest has got into um, manga recently, so he's reading all sorts of interesting stuff there. That's great. Um, and I think we're, you know, we've seen, I think we're seeing the same with video games in that on balance, I think they are positive things in people's lives. And again, as with everything, there's always a way, you know, there's always a way it can be done. Too much of anything is not necessarily a good thing. But I, I, like I say, I think we're seeing absolutely that these are positive things broadly. And, you know, one of the things for me, you know, and again, I know this isn't necessarily everybody's experience, but my experience of gaming, um, of the, the friends that I play games with, of the games that I've engaged with, 
they've been incredibly positive for my own social well-being and things like that. And which is what, you know, one of the things that I love about, and I still play lots of games, is, you know, I see it as actually a really healthy form of enjoyment is like I get together with a bunch of friends and we, you know, we'll play Call of Cthulhu or we'll play playing Kill Team at the moment, playing a lot of Blood Bowl, stuff like that. And, you know, that that's great. Mm, yeah. I mean, you, you've alluded to a couple of themes from a, a TED Talk that you did in 2013 there, which was sort of looking at gaming culture and and it's sort of ex- examining that intersection between gaming and economics and politics and democracy and stuff. Could you summarize? I know it's probably unfair, but could you sort yeah, of summarize no, no, that no. TED talk from from uh, back then? So so that yeah, it was a TEDx talk, and it was so it was run by the Houses of Parliament, and they asked me to talk about what what are the if any links between gaming and democracy and and because on the surface of those they they maybe seem like these are completely separate worlds but but actually they're not and i think what i talked about there is a lot of really interesting examples of how you've seen gaming um communities evolve all sorts of different ways of it of, of trying to figure out how they're going to engage with this world so you know one of the examples um was eve online where players essentially are paying a subscription service to a game and there was a point where they some of the players were like are not happy with necessarily the service or the decisions being made and so they protested the people making the game running the game community and that then the end result of that and there's loads of fascinating stuff online about it and you can grab the tedx talk uh, off my blog if, if you want to see it um but it ends up them forming a player council where people are elected to the player council thing that guides the company and the decisions being made. And to me, that's fascinating because it's this thing where on the one hand, EVE Online is a commercial project. You know, they're a commercial entity. They can do within the realms of the law, they can do what they want with it. But at the same time, people are putting a lot of time and effort into this thing. And, you know, you kind of have to listen to your players. Like you, you need to understand where your players are. And so to me, the, the you know, you can mirror that Again, I'm simplifying it slightly, but, you know, it mirrors some of the movements of democracy. So, you know, the, the famous U.S. thing, no taxation without representation, where the the, the colonists in the, in, the, in the U.S. colonies were paying taxes back to the U.K., but they didn't have any representation and they felt, well, hang on, I'm paying something and I don't get a say, you know, and I, and I think there's a there's a rough, but there is a, a sort of parallel of, of of that hap- that happened in the Eve Online situation. So yeah, that for me, I, I think there are interesting parts there. Again, they they become complicated, they intermish, they're not they don't match exactly, but I definitely think they're interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I lost a great many hours to Eve Online during my university days when I should have been studying because it it was a fascinating <laughs> sort of community to be part of. But yeah, do, do you think that that culture within eve or just generally within gaming has evolved and changed since you gave that talk in 2013 oh oh absolutely i mean again the things you know tools like discord and slack and you know sort of various stuff and then the, the nature of how people play online stuff has evolved massively since then you know i, I think if i was asked to re-give that talk i'd have to kind of have a think about how i engage with it now because it's you know in some of those trends that i picked up there have sort of grown and some of them have not it, it's it's a complicated picture, but I think what what hasn't really changed is the centrality of gaming in our culture. It's just grown more so, and so I th- I think thinking of the world, thinking the world where if you're a gamer, you you think in some senses that help shape your thinking. I think that's very much still the case. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you also so you mentioned that you created or co-founded auroc digital uh, yeah what what was the sort of and and it started as a consultancy but what was the sort of initial remit and then how did that change to actual game development what, what sort of drove that journey well before founding auroc you know I, I was a game designer so I, you know i had done years of game design before that and so the consultancy came out really that there's an organization called the welcome trust and uh, i i sort of got a contract with them to like i say help them understand this because they uh, the Wellcome Trust is a fascinating organisation, um, uh, and they, they they engage with they they fund through grants and various other things a variety of types of media. So they'd fund they'd fund film, they'd fund TV stuff, they'd fund you know theatre, theater, dance, art pieces. And at the time, they were like, "Well, we're not doing anything game." So they wanted somebody to help them say, 
this is and again this to me is part of that that the the kind of rise of gaming is a valid part of the culture that they were like okay let's you know let, let let's engage with that so they they gave me a contract to do that and as part of that i founded myself and my wife founded or digital to kind of house that work and then for the next couple of years i did that sort of work again as the parliament um with the parliamentary education service did bits of stuff with the bbc various other other things with the royal society um, so I was very honoured to work with all these sort of organisations, helping them understand this kind of rising cultural force in gaming. And then, yeah, after doing that for a bit, which I very much enjoyed, I obviously just wanted to go back to making games. And that was, you know, so I did the news gaming for a bit, which we learned a lot about and it was really good. And then um, at that point, Games Workshop sort of changed how they were engaging with licensed stuff. And then that led to us doing Chainsaw Warrior and then that, sort of took what we were doing in Auroc in a new direction um, from that. Well, I, yeah, I'm interested in this, the, the Chainsaw Warrior as a sort of starting point for that that sort of new era. I mean, because obviously that's an adaptation of an existing board game that you've then taken yeah. and t- turned into a sort of digital experience. I mean, what's that? what does that process look like? It, how, how do you go about taking something physical and making it digital? Um, well, f- for us, it was a, you know, we wanted to do within there there was a straightforward translation of it so you know basically exactly as you would play the game and the advantage that a a video game version of something has is that it can handle all of the the rules admin for you so you know if you attack a zombie and roll the dice it can do all the calculations as to what should happen with it so in that sense it was a straight translation of the system that Stephen Hand had built and then we obviously then had to put a graphics wrapper on it and things like that um and what was, you know, so some of those graphics had to be recreated because the originals, you know, we could scan in the stuff that was in a, a box and I had my own copy of it. And there were some scan ins of some of the originals, but a lot of the stuff just didn't exist anymore at high enough resolution to make it work for us. So we had to create new stuff like the cover art, for example. We created new stuff there. And then because you've got the system in a video game thing, then you can play around and give people a couple of options with it. So again, we gave a couple of options of, if you like, difficulty settings, the hard setting being the kind of original out the box, this is how you do it. And then giving people a couple of little different, you know, setup type things. So yeah, and I mean, that whole thing took about three months to make the first version of that onto mobile. And then after going to mobile, we we did a version onto Steam and that was our first game on Steam. Uh, and that was an important milestone in, in the development of the company that suddenly we were making games on you know what was then steam is a much more open platform now it's it's you know you can you like anyone can make a game on steam you pay like a hundred dollars to access the thing but back then steam wasn't that it was you they kind of had to invite you in and you know chainsaw warrior was the way we got invited in to put a game on steam right I and mean, why why chainsaw warrior out of interest because it's quite a niche it's almost a forgotten classic from the gw vaults in a way yeah, well, it would be, like I said, at the time there was a there was a shift at GW, which you know where they were they were opening up their licenses to not just big companies but smaller companies, which you know we benefited from that. And so yeah, I just chatted to them and I was like, I love this game. Can I just do a video game version? It was it wasn't like some super thought out business plan thing. It was just <laughs> like I would really like to do this. And so yeah, for me it was a bit of a labor of love. And you know we you know and it it, it did all right for us. And it it certainly. Again, it, it led to the next stage of our relationship with Games Workshop and as a game development studio. But yeah, at its root was just, I really want to do this. Well, which can sometimes be the absolute, you know, that passion yeah. project can definitely be how you get the great art, like you say. I mean, yeah. what's, uh, what you, you, did, you mentioned Dark Future as well, which obviously is quite, yeah. quite a different kind of adaptation because you're not just recreating the sort of mechanics of, of the board game in quite the same way for that game. So how did that differ in terms of like development and production? So with, with Dark Future, our approach was slightly different in that we weren't looking to do a straight adaptation of the board game. Not that there's anything wrong with the board game. Like it, you know, it's, it, like I say, I really loved it, but it was an opportunity to kind of like, here we're going to take the setting and do something slightly different. So I think I wanted to get a sense of the fact that, you know, I didn't want to create just a racing game out of it or, or you know, that kind of thing. And again, not that there's anything wrong with those genres, it's just not what I want to do. Because obviously on the board game, it is a tactical game. Um, and so 
it was like, how do we go about doing that? So what we ended up doing was creating this this kind of hybrid between real time because their cars driving along and turn based. So if you've played it, you can obviously slow time down, make your choices of what you're going to do, and then bring time back up into its full speed, and it plays out the thing. So you you control cars within, you know, you control interceptors within the game, but you don't drive them directly. So it's not about direct control. So for me, I was really pleased with the work we did on that. The team did an amazing job, and you know, and again, we were able to play around with the law and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that that was that, that was doing something very different with the IP. Um, and and I think what was great from our point of view is it allowed us to kind of further build. That was the third game we did Games Workshop because we did a Chains of Warrior sequel as well, which again was a was an original creation on our part within the spirit of the original. And then we did um, Dark Future, and then um, yeah, and, and obviously at that point, you know, having done three games with Games Workshop, we built a relationship with them, and you know, to me. I mean, I don't know how they see it, but I, I saw it as like we were gradually building our way up to the bigger and bigger IPs until eventually, you know, we we arrive at um, doing Warhammer 40,000 Bolt Gun. Yeah, which which has been a sort of a, a recent a big release, hasn't it? So that's kind of a, a retro first person shooter set in yeah. the 40k universe. So, I mean, that I again, I imagine is quite a different development process to, to what you've done before with the other two uh, IPs. Yeah, it was it was yeah, it was very different. So so again, we we sort of came up with the idea within Auroc and we pitched it to Games Workshop and they really liked the idea and then we set about making a demo with it and then you've got to get published and all these various things. But but at its root, I think, is was this sense that, you know, the there'd been this sort of early movement then of retro shooters and you know for me, old enough, they weren't just retro, they were shooters because I played them <laughs> they were just the thing you played, like Doom and you know quake and stuff like that uh and and it was just one of these things where it just naturally it's like this game should have existed what if it had existed what would it look like and then and then um so one of my colleagues uh pete pilak produced some early concept art that and, and you were like yeah that that's so cool you know and that helped us kind of sell it as part of it uh and and you know we were lucky enough to have some really great people you know on the project so a colleague of mine, Aaron Ashbrook, who's our creative director, he really had, you know, was key in the idea and driving it forward. And then um, my colleague Nina, um, Nina Adams, sort of took it forward as as her first sort of big project. That she did a lot of the, the biz dev side of stuff. And there's I'm name a few people. There's a lot of people involved, but I think you know now I've started naming a couple of people. Yeah. I should throw a few more, you know, great works. But we, you know, um, and again, we, we, we'd we radically revamped our production system and, and our production director, Peter Willington, done a lot of work on that. And all of those various things came together. Like it was the right time for the right game. And we had the right people who both loved retro shooters and shooters in general and loved Warhammer. And so in a way, you know, it, it was a love letter to Warhammer. Like it was a love letter to to retro games like Doom and Quake and you know Unreal Tournament and stuff like that. So you know it, it was the right. It was we were the you know lucky enough to be the right people at the right time at the right point to make this because and yeah and like I say we pitched it made a demo the demo was great fun and yeah it just kind of flowed from there really. I mean because it is it is terrific fun and it's it's I, I'm just. A- Curious about the the line that has to be walked in terms of because it is a love letter to to the forty k universe and you've got some really deep cuts in terms of like creatures you fight and stuff grabbed from all over forty k lore but it is also a love letter to you know the retro gaming space so how do you manage to like how do you capture the spirit of both of those things and sort of stay true to those different things at the same time in in and create a third thing I guess yeah. Well, I, I think I think at its heart, because we're all into that, is you're always at the point of like, is this something that I would want to play? Like, is this something I would just enjoy playing? If 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 somebody else had made this, if another studio made it, would I go and buy it? And you, whenever we're working on it, and as we're going through it, I always ask myself that question. And and if the answer is like, yeah, I would I would pay I would pay my own cash for this, and you know you're on the right track. I think the other thing when you're working on a game, and this applies to a lot of games we've done is, you know, working in the industry, I play a lot of games and, and inevitably you get a bit analytical and you're writing notes, this works, this doesn't work. But for me, the sign when something's really working is when you get lost in enjoying playing the game and you stop writing all your notes and being analytical and you just find yourself in the moment playing the game, like in this state of flow. Um, 
And that that's like, okay, that's captured it. And that happens so much with bolt gun playing demos and test things. We play it and I'm like, I'm just gonna have a quick look at this. And then I spend more time in there than I planned because I'm just having fun, you know, chainsawing in half, like, uh, you know, chaos cultists and stuff like that. So it's just like, yeah, this is working. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you mentioned like, you know, there the, are a lot of lessons learned through those uh, earlier experiments with the news games and sort of those kind of and and also the the research and the talks that you've done from a a, a sort of a culture gaming culture perspective did it, how do you f- sort of keep hold of that stuff at the same time as creating a fun a fun game that or do you just say you know what actually it's okay sometimes some games are just going to be for fun and sometimes some games are going to do this other thing is, is that something yeah. that's in your mind I mean, with some of the news games, they were deliberately, like the one I described was deliberately to be a bit frustrating because we were trying to convey something. But that, you know, that's a, a a smaller experience. I think when you're making a bigger experience, being engaged to play it, I think is the way I'd say it, is always important. And and fun is like fun, from a game design point of view, fun is a kind of interesting because the, the overall experience needs to be fun, but there will be moments maybe when it's not necessarily as fun. And you might think, well, of course, it's always got to be fun. But let's take the example of like a horror story. Um, we take a horror story as an example. You watch a horror film. There'll be moments in watching that film with a jump scare or something like that where you're not having fun at that moment where you're scared. But the overall experience to you is I enjoyed that. And I, and I think it's similar like games. I think we want the overall experience of something that I want to do this, even if there's moments of stress or frustration or difficulty or challenge. Um, and so, yeah, for me, the, there's no magic formula of kind of balancing it. You just have to kind of do a lot of work of, of playing and replaying and tweaking to get that right balance of it. Um, but yeah, it, it is essential that ultimately it has to be something you want to do. And I think with the, the stuff that we've connected the real world, what to me is really important with that is, you know, what you don't want is what, you know, a, a, a colleague at Welcome once referred as, as chocolate-coated broccoli, which is this idea of you should eat broccoli because it's good for you. Well, let's coat it in chocolate and then you want to eat it. It's like, well, that's not an experience. It's you should you should be true to what you're trying to do um, and get that balance right. So actually, when you want somebody to ingest some information or useful thing, it shouldn't feel like homework or a chore because as soon as it feels like that, you just you just disengage. That so that baking in the kind of enjoyable part of the experience is absolutely central to game design it is kind of really key. Again, this is an area where you've seen a lot of explosion in game techniques being used in learning, which I think is great because at its heart, this is always one of the challenges that game developers, be they physical or digital, have is you have this whole system and a world, and we need to teach you all this stuff. We've got to teach you how to play Warhammer 4000. We've got to teach you how to play D&D. We've got to teach you how to play bolt gun. And the longer we take to teach you how to do it, the more likely you're going to bounce off that and go, well, this isn't for me. I've got bored. I don't understand. You know, I'm stepping away. So games have become very good at teaching a bunch of complicated information, often with a mix of I show you something, then you do it. I show you a new thing and then you do it. And then I show you a few of the things you can do and then you do them, and then I say, discover the rest, you know. And so that's one of the things, like, I think why you've seen so much rising gaming is it, it is a great way, you know, when we play games, we learn huge amounts, whether we want to or not. But obviously, we're driven to learn them because we know we're going to have fun and enjoy the process at the end. So, you know, that initial, you get a new game, that initial learning that new game is often hard work or less fun, which is, but once you've got it and you've started playing it and then you get to that next stage where actually you start to master the system and you understand the, the nuances of it. And again, as a, a 40K player, you know, Rogue Trader 40K player, I was a I was a, a good player as in understood the rules. So, you know, in that phase when Rogue Trader was out, but before they had army lists and that, I was I was very adept at using the rules in my favour. So, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you would have things like there's a las cutter um, in there, which is a piece of equipment, not a weapon in the original Rogue Trader. And you're like, well, I'm going to equip all my troops with las cutters because there's no hit roll or saving or, or it just does damage. So you'd just be able to destroy vehicles and stuff like that. And it's within the rules. Like, you know, that's, <laughs> where, you know, that's where you, but that's an annoying thing to play. But again, as these systems evolve and then they realize that actually we need to tweak these rules to make the, the fun part of it happen. And, and that to me, again, is always one of the things I love about to me, a well-designed game, players will find 
exploits within the rules. And that is both a success because you've got enough people playing it that they find the exploits and also can potentially ruin a game if everybody uses the exploits, the fun goes out of it. And so that's why games are always in a dialogue you know, we mentioned EVE Online, but, you know, any popular successful game is always in a dialogue with its players where they're constantly tweaking how they do things and the players are constantly looking for new ways of doing stuff. Mm. And that kind of prompts a thought as well. I mean, I'm sure you will have had a similar experience as many people have when you're trying to, certainly back in, you know, 10, 20 plus years ago, trying to introduce someone to a role-playing game and they just, it was an alien concept. It just didn't make any <laughs> sense. Or even with a, a controller for a video game console you put it in someone's hands and they've never experienced it before they just don't know it feels strange whereas now there's a lot of sort of almost across it's like a societal knowledge yeah. has developed where people understand those basic mechanisms of dice rolling and role playing and and video game controllers so you can almost start from a higher level when you're designing a new game so does that allow you to do more and, and sort of experiment more because there's already a base knowledge that's out there? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So if you're doing a first person shooter now, there's there's so much culturally that you expect in how to control that, that you 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 have to do a lot less work teaching people how to play bolt gun than you might do Mars Horizon 2, which is going to have you know lots of complicated systems that interlock with each other, which is part of the gameplay. Um but again, what's fascinating with these things is then when people learn it, then people can play with it. So you look at a game like Super Hot, and it takes the tropes that we know with first-person shooters, and it plays with time as part of the. If you played Super Hot, it's the game where the bullets move when you do. So if you stand still, the bullets stand, don't fire towards you, and as soon as you move, they start moving. And so it adds this new dimension to it, and and that's one of the things I love about the, the working in both video games and tabletop games is designers and creators are constantly playing with the boundaries of what what works and what doesn't work and that that's really exciting as as part of it mm, yeah oh and well i suppose i was just going to mention bolt gun obviously it's a sort of it seems like it's been quite a success there seems to have been quite a lot of positive buzz oh, around. Yeah, no, what has reception been like well for the game yeah. yeah no it's done extremely well for us but again you know we we've innovated a bit within that like i would call out a few of the, the things that we've done so that the kind of the, the Marines kind of jump attack that he does when he squashes, you know, enemies and things like that. There's like a conscious thing of giving you the, the sense of what it's like to be a space Marine while at the same time, that's fun to play. Um, you know, uh, and then stuff like the, you know, the taunts, which have become very meme and a lot of fun, but you know, that, that, that sort of thing, like it doesn't play a gameplay function, but it very much is enjoyable to do. And, you know, and then, you know, one of the bits I love most is obviously the idle animation where he takes out the codec to, you know, to read the, you know, it's a very ultramarine thing to do. And it's it's that sort of thing. It's like that combination of things that have a gameplay value, but things that convey the spirit and the, the love of the, the genre. You're trying to wrap all those things in together as part of it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I suppose, I, I mean, I guess that the sort of natural question is, would, would there be more exploration of, of the sort of bulk gun version of 40K? Might we see m more in that kind of space down the line, do you think? Um can't say unfortunately i mean what i can ask people to do it sounds like a sh you, you've lined me up a shameless plug but it's not but it, it, so auric digital does a newsletter so if you go to a, a website and hopefully you can put a link in the show mm -hmm. notes um we have a newsletter so everything we do will be there but but yeah i i, I i'm not in a position to sort of say sure stuff at the moment. <laughs> no i definitely put you on the spot there thomas so sorry that's, that's all right. it's fine, thomas. <laughs> but you've also developed games for the tabletop as well, haven't you? You've done some some card games, and you did an Agatha Christie card game as well. Yeah, so this is yeah, so there's a mix of stuff here. So the we did a a board game version for Mars Horizon called Mars Horizon Blastoff, um, which again, you know, we we taken over to the European Space Agency and and taken to the UK Space Agency thing and played with people there, and that actually came out of like sometimes when you're designing a game, you do a lot of early prototype work. If you're doing a prototype for a first-person shooter, you know, we built that in Unreal, and that has a lot of tools to allow you to do it, but it still takes a good, I think it took us three months um, to make the prototype for that, to put all the bits together to it. If you're making a strategy game, you've got a slight advantage and you can put it together as pen and paper stuff. You can, and again, this is one of, one of the reasons why designing tabletop stuff I find really enjoyable, is if you decide to change the rules, you're, you've got a prototype of a strategy game in a video game, and you're like, I want to change a bunch of the rules, not not the values, because you can change those quickly. If you're like, oh, if you 
if you add this shield to this unit, they get plus one to their armor. That's easy. And you want to change it to plus two, you can just change the numbers in the, the program. But if you're like, oh, I'm going to change the way it handles armor completely, that could be anything from a couple of days code work to maybe even a couple of weeks to redo it, depending on how you've done it. Whereas when you're designing a tabletop game, you're like, I want to change the way armor works. You can just cross out the rules you've written and write new ones and just try it there and then. So as a game designer, it's very enjoyable to have that immediacy with how you do it. So yeah, we had as part of, so game Mars Horizon has the, the mission loop. So when you're actually in the mission, what you do and the management loop and, and a, a, an earlier part of it, we developed some pen and paper prototypes for that. And one of them was kind of a lot of fun. And then that we ended up going off and kickstarting that successfully. And, and that made the kind of the, the blast off version. The Agatha Christie one came around because uh, again, uh, somebody I knew through the industry was working with the Agatha Christie um, uh it's called Agatha Christie Limited and, and with, with the Agatha Christie's grandson. And they wanted a game to kind of reflect stuff. And, and it just struck me like there's obviously been this huge renaissance in board games over the last few years, which is very exciting. And I thought this would really suit a social deduction game. I mean, Agatha Christie, social deduction, they, they just go together. And so, yeah, that, that, that design came out of that. And so Auroc Digital did the initial design work with, with myself sort of leading on that. And then we partnered with um, Modifius, and also I've got a small board game company called Boston Horus. We partnered there to kind of bring that to life. And that's done extremely well. I'm, I'm incredibly pleased to say I think we're on some like the eighth printing of it. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, that's, that's been great fun. Yeah, that's great. And it, 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 again, to put you on the spot, is there more in the tabletop space that you're looking at or would like to do in the future? Oh, there's there's definitely stuff I'd like to do in the tabletop thing. Like I'm, I'm very, in, like I, I got back into RPGs over the last few years, I, I think like a lot of people, you know, sort of rediscovered that love. So, uh, uh, in fact, you know, so both playing them and and that's and then naturally as as somebody who creates stuff led me to wanting to make more. So, yeah, I definitely want to do more in that space. Hmm. I mean, the, 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 I, I was just just looping back to the video games development piece. Uh, the, the timelines that you were talking about there, so you, it can be quite quick to get a prototype together. But what's the sort of what kind of timeline is there behind making a game? I'm just curious. Well, yeah, so so Bolt Gun in total, end-to-end, -end, I think was about three years. Right. So from us making the prototype to the one coming out in players' hands. Um, and that's, like I say, that's not unusual for a bigger game. You know, your your big AAA games, if you've got, let's say, you know, a Call of Duty one where they've got big releases every year, they may have two, three development studios working on that stuff in order to keep that release cadence because it's it's a lot of work goes into it. Um, so yeah, I mean the process from you know in that in that case we got the prototype. We we then needed a publisher. And we we spoke with the we pitched it to a few publishers. We ended up working with Focus, who've been great. Um, and then you know then what happens is that you you've then got obviously Focus Games Workshop us. You develop a, a plan of how you want that development to go. So we we work out you know all the, you know we map out all of the stages from where we are now to when it's in people's hands. All the things we have to do. There's big planning sessions and replanning sessions. Then you obviously have to recruit a team of people who can do all these various things. So it's quite an involved process. So the bolt gun team at its smallest was probably, I think about five people working on it. And at its biggest probably had about 30, 30 odd people at its height. And again, you will have a smaller team in the early stages where you're prototyping and figuring things out. And then that turns into a much bigger team when you know what you're doing and you've just got lots of stuff that needs making you need weapons and effects and levels and you know scenery and furniture and all, all that kind of stuff and then as a lot of that gets created and integrated that team slims down a little bit not not hugely because you're making less stuff and you're just integrating what you've got but then there's a lot of play testing and balancing and looking for bugs and that's where your QA team comes in and, and, and a key there and then obviously you you do the porting work to bring it to all the different platforms that it's going to be on. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty involved process, and that's why it all takes so long because there's so many components to it that have to come together. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and, and given the number of people who are involved in this kind of production, I suppose in the same way as, as like movies, I suppose so many different hands, so many different artistic visions. Do you think that that influences any of the conversation around? It as an art form because there isn't a single voice there isn't a single author a single artist it's, it's a it's the work of many artists together so does that have any any sort of play in that conversation do you think 
Yeah, I, I I think for for my experience of games is they are they are very team centric. Like, sure, you have people taking leadership roles, maybe in art, code, design, overall, and and they they help drive that and shape that pretty significantly. But and you do see individual indie creators doing everything themselves. But you know, but a lot of those games take literally. You know, I've seen one that's like like a decade in the making so the, the the fewer people you've got either the less you can do or the more you the more you have to do so the longer it takes but yeah games in general from my experience are very much team efforts and so you know you you have to do a lot of work in running a game development team to keep everybody with that singular creative vision because you know even small decisions that people might be taking about controls or user interface or exactly you know how the lighting might work on a level or what weapons would be. They've all got to pull in the right direction. They've all got to pull in the same direction. And that's easier said than done because, you know, if you say, well, you know, if, if, you know any game you're working on, you you want, you need everybody to buy into that vision. And what was helpful with Bolt Gun is that vision was simple. It, you know, it's a retro shooter, but it's Warhammer. Um, and but you still have to do a lot of work to make sure all the team is still pulling in the right direction. They're all pulling in the same thing, and and there's thousands of individual decisions made by all those team members over the course of that you know three years making it. That if you're not all in the right direction, you can it can start to get a little bit lost. And again, I, I think often if you look at games that have not really worked out, and you know we've done games that you know I've not not worked out the kind of way I wanted them to necessarily. Some of that is often that that central vision either wasn't communicated or wasn't tight enough or something along those lines and then conversely when it does work and it all comes together you can really see it and obviously bolt gun mass rise and you know the vision in the end came together really excitingly mm. i suppose the natural question just as we've talked about gaming and art and all that sort of stuff it is and i i will with the exception of games you've worked on or, or from your studios which games do you think have attained that level of art or are moving in that direction like that that are they're out there that people can play um so yeah i mean so let, let's take the video games there's a video game creator called bennett foddy and um he's made a whole bunch of, of stuff that i think has that artistic component to it um where it's a kind of discourse around it there's a game uh you know and, and if you go to each you know, dot I, there's a lot of independent creators creating both tabletop stuff there and digital stuff. And there's so much experimentation going on in there that I think, you know, they, they've, to me, to me, like I say, art comes around where there's other layers of meaning going on it. And again, you know, I think if you look at say the 28 magazine and the, 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 the community that's built around there, I think they're doing amazing work, not just creating fantastic things, but at, interpret the creating things that are open to a wider interpretation um and that's where you get into the realm of art and, and that to me is really exciting it's that it's that how do we drift from craft as i mentioned so you know when i paint miniatures and i'm painting a norse blood bowl team at the moment um they are definitely craft like i'm i'm not a skilled enough at that i love it and i enjoy it but i'm not skilled enough that, that i'm doing something else but then when you start taking those pieces and, you know, the, I was looking at one of the white doors recently, and there's some astounding dioramas there. I think at that point in a diorama, it can start to become art because you, you're you telling a story and there's meaning and some of that meaning might be overt, but some of that meaning might not. And if the meaning that the person looking at that diorama takes away is different from the meaning the creator intended, then you're getting into this, this other level. And that to me is where it starts to get really fascinating. And the ultimate thing of that is that the, the Chapman brothers who are kind of young British artists, famous from the nineties, they made this huge piece. I think it's called hell, which is loads. And they, they, it's kind of like a, a, a weird amalgam of the dead rising up to destroy. I think it's like a Nazi death camp thing. And they've, you know, there's thousands of little miniatures that they've created in this thing. No one doubts that's art, but the skills and techniques they use to create that piece, and, it's, and again, maybe we can pop a link in the show notes, this famous piece of art is, is exactly the techniques that people making a diorama or putting together, you know, standard hobby stuff would use. And, and to me, that that was an interesting thing of like, if, if, a, if the intentionality is, if the artist says, I'm putting together a bunch of miniatures into a scene to tell a story, and it's art, no one's saying, no, that's not art. So to me, in a way, that was like, well, that means anyone can make art. 
It doesn't mean everybody has to, and I'm not saying everybody doing hobby now has to consider the artistic impact of it, not. But I am very open to people making pieces and saying, what do you think? And me looking at that going, that's art, you know? Yeah. So hopefully not too long until we've got Space Marines and Necrons in the Tate Modern then. Uh, well, you know, so one of the news games we did, there was an exhibition at the VNA, and they used a screenshot from one of that of one of our news games at VA, and I was incredibly honoured, you know, to be part of that. So we've had a piece in a proper museum, and yeah, I, absolutely. I know there's been a couple of exhibitions, but no, I, I do not think it, it. I I think it's entirely reasonable to expect that in a few years' time, there will be something like a John Blanche piece in a major gallery somewhere in the world as part of the recognition of the cultural impact and the artistic impact that it's had. And I think that would be rightly so. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Great. Well, yeah, who knows in a like hundred years time, like in the same way, you know, the, the pictures of the expressionists and, you know, the, the various other art movements are, are, are command vast sums and a display in maybe a hundred years time. A lot of these iconic pieces, like, you know, say epic third edition or warhammer first edition second edition third edition with the black templars would be on display yeah in the louvre or something like that you know <laughs> that i I, th I think reasonably so like they are they are cultural artifacts definitely yeah i think that makes perfect sense and, and isn't unreasonable at all to suggest yeah yeah well I really appreciate you taking the time out, Thomas, to chat to me about gaming culture and your experiences and your work. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation, so thank you. Yeah, well, I just want to, you know, do a, a, a thank back. Like, uh, I've been a fan of your channel. channel. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a patron of the channel, Patreon of the channel, I'm not sure how you say it. Um, uh, and, and really enjoyed being all that stuff. And, and I, I really love the, the 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 kind of positivity that you bring to the hobby. And it's just a real, like every time one of your, you know, notification drops that there's a new video, it's always like brightens my day. Uh, so a big thank you for all the work you're doing too. <laughs> well, that's very sweet of you to say. Thank you. What a terrific chat. Thank you, Thomas, so much for joining me. It was a brilliant and stimulating conversation. And Thomas has shared with me a load of links that I've included in the description below so you can follow up on a lot of the really interesting and fascinating ideas that he raised in our chat. You can also find in the description below links to my Patreon, my Ko-fi, my Discord, and my Element Games affiliate links. So if you want to use any of those to support the channel, please feel free to take a look. Thank you once again to Thomas for joining me. Thank you for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. <laughs>